Okay, so we are still talking about techniques of integration. Uh, actually, uh, if you uh, uh, if you look in our textbook, uh, there is chapter, I think chapter seven, which is uh, uh, dedicated to the topic of uh, techniques of integration. Uh, so we will talk much more about, we will discuss this topic in much more details a little bit later. Uh, we have seen last time already one of the most easiest techniques, which is the substitution rule, which essentially is the uh, corresponding rule for integration, which the rule which corresponds to the chain rule. So it's kind of, uh, you can say it's the inverse of the chain rule. Now, uh, uh, just one more application, something which you are actually aware of. Uh, uh, just to make it precise, uh, so if you, whenever you encounter a symmetric function, uh, Normally, the situation is a little bit uh, more easier, in particular if the integral is from uh, is over a symmetric interval, s symmetric about the origin. Uh, now, if uh, so, you have here two cases of symmetry, even and odd. Uh, so, if f is a function, so assume that. f is a function. Is a continuous function. On A B, uh, on, on, on the special interval which is uh, from minus A to A, sorry. Uh, so in, uh, we have two cases. Uh, so assume that uh, if f is even, then from the area interpretation, actually, it's, you immediately see that if you compute this integral here, it's just the same as computing twice the integral from 0 to a f of x dx. So if you look at areas, it's immediately clear. And uh, uh, second case, if f is odd, then this integral, so again from the area interpretation, or the interpretation of the definite integral is a net area, uh, this integral must be equal to zero. Uh, I just want to emphasize that those two uh, uh, rules uh, or facts follow from, the sub uh, from a substitution rule. Because you start with the integral from minus a to a, f of x dx, and you write this as the integral from minus a to zero, f of x dx plus the integral from 0 to a, f of x dx. Now, this, this integral you can write as minus the integral from 0 to minus a, f of x dx plus the integral from 0 to a, f of x dx. Okay, and if you use for the first one the substitution x is equal to, let's say, minus u, then you see that uh, dx is equal to minus du, so this minus it cancels out. Uh, and what you have is the integral from 0 to a of f of minus u du plus the integral from 0 to a f of x dx. Okay, so if uh, f is even, then uh, f of minus u is equal to f of u, so those two integrals are the same. And uh, if f is odd, then f of minus u is minus f of minus u. And uh, so in this case, it's minus f of u and those two integrals cancel. Okay, so uh, actually this is something which you see immediately from the substitution rule, uh, from the area interpretation of the definite integral, uh, but if you want to have a formal proof, uh, then uh, uh, this is what you have to do. So essentially you have to use the substitution rule in order to prove something like this. Okay, so I guess no questions to, to this here. So. Uh, uh, this is something which actually, uh, sometimes it's easy to forget that uh, some integrals uh, are very easy, in particular in this case here, that some integrals are very easy to evaluate uh, uh, just by observing that the integral is an odd function. So for instance, if you have uh, the integral from minus 1 to 1, x to the 4, sine uh, 3, x to the uh, cube, dx, 
It would be not easy to compute this integral, okay? If you really want to find first the antiderivative of this function and then evaluate it at minus 1 and 1, but it's, of course, easy to observe that this function here is an odd function, so the value must be equal to 0. So just keep this in mind. Sometimes it's uh, easy to forget. If you encounter a complicated integral, uh, uh, it's... Uh, because uh, if you know more about... Uh, uh, integration, if you know many techniques, uh, normally you tend just to look at the integrand and uh, use the techniques you have learned for certain classes of integrands. Uh, uh, but just keep in mind that uh, uh, it's always worth it first to check whether uh, 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 the given integrand uh, uh, is even or odd. So in, odd, in the odd case, the integral can be computed immediately, and in the even case, you can at least simplify it. There are, of course, other cases, so it's not, it's not, it's not necessary that, uh, uh, because, for instance, here even, uh, in this case, even means even about the origin, about the y-axis, uh, but uh, a function could also be symmetric about another axis. Uh, uh, examples for this are, if the integrand are trigonometric functions, they are quite often not symmetric about, uh, so you integrate something from zero to pi or something like this, and uh, you might have a symmetry at pi half. Uh, and also in such cases, you can, you can uh, uh, use this here, or either this, uh, also this can happen. So sometimes the uh, integral might look like, uh, uh, so even so the function, because this is a very easy example, uh, here the function is symmetric about the origin, but uh, sometimes uh, the symmetry might be around some other point. And if you suitable uh, divide the integration interv interval into two subintervals, it might be easy to see immediately that the integral is equal to zero. There are also examples for this. So, so, so just keep this in mind, that symmetry, uh, in many cases, uh, can simplify the task of integration. OK, so uh, uh, before, we, uh, before we go on and learn more about integration techniques, uh, uh, we will uh, uh, Actually, today and next time, we will uh, already look at some applications of integration. But before we do so, uh, this is now the right time, as I have explained last time, to give for the first time a precise definition of exponential functions. This is something actually which, uh, uh, where your high school teacher has cheated, but you all believed him or her. So uh, uh, in s somehow in high school, they made you believe that you know what exponential functions are. Okay, but actually, as I have explained here in the first class, uh, uh, it's not so easy. We have seen it's not so easy to precisely define uh, an exponential function. Okay, so uh, uh, we will see today that, that one approach, one possible approach to precisely define exponential functions uh, is by using the theory of integration. There are other, there are other approaches. We will learn another approach uh, uh, next semester, which is... Uh, uh, based on series, but there are many, many different ways to precisely define the exponential function. Uh, one of them we are going to learn today. Now, uh, maybe it, it's worth to uh, remind you, okay, uh, where are the difficulties in, in order to define an exponential function? So maybe let's look once more at the basic problem. Uh, uh, we have, we want to define something like this here, so the A is larger than zero. This is what we have done in the first lecture. Okay. So uh, normally, th uh, the way you do it in high school is uh, uh, maybe in middle school you already look at the case where x is a, a natural number. So uh, if uh, x is a natural number, so this is the first case, then it's very easy. So, you, uh, so actually you, you start to define this function for natural numbers, uh, for natural numbers, uh, you have, uh, okay, so this is uh, a times a times a and so on, uh, overall x times. Okay, then uh, uh, what you do in, I'm not sure, this maybe is in middle school, uh, then you add the case x is equal to zero, so here you just define it uh, as equal to one, so this is the definition, and uh, then maybe if you come to high, when you come to high school, or maybe even earlier, uh, you extend this symbol to negative numbers. Okay, so uh, if you have a to the minus x, uh, so we observe that a to the x, uh, that a to the x, uh, uh, so, so here x is a natural number actually, 
Uh, I should write this like this, right? Uh, uh, so here we define it as 1 over a to the x, and we observe that a to the x is already defined by case 1. Okay, so uh, till now, no problem. So now we have defined already this symbol uh, for all x, which are uh, integers. Uh, and uh, then in high school, you add the case where x is a rational number. So in this case, uh, you can write uh, x as uh, p over q. The q is not equal to 0. And uh, you define the symbol a to the x uh, as the q's root. So it's also the definition as the q's root of uh, a to the b. OK. And uh, you have to make sure, because this definition looks pretty different, uh, uh, in particular for uh, representing a rational number as a fraction, you have many different ways. Uh, for instance, you can represent x as, as, as 1, or you can uh, represent it as 2 over 2, or 3 over 3, and so on. But because of the properties of the uh, root here, and the, and the properties of the symbol you have already defined, okay, no matter how, which which representation for x you choose, you always get here the same value. So it's well, well def this is what we call in mathematics well-defined. Okay, because you, here you have several choices, and you have to make sure that different choices for this representation are not leading to different values here. And this is not the case because uh, you have here certain properties for a to the x and certain properties for the root function, which you study normally in high school first, and uh, then you define this symbol. Okay, and uh, uh, so this is maybe what you do in high school. I'm not sure how, uh, how the symbol was defined if x is uh, uh, a real number. I'm not sure uh, uh, how, how this is done in high school. Uh, but because actually this is a, this complicated. Okay, so now, so, so the, the essential question, as I have explained in the first lecture, is okay. Now, if x is a irrational number, okay, how do you define this symbol? So, for instance, if x is equal to square root of two, okay, how to define a to the square root of two? Now, uh, I have explained to you in in the first lecture, okay, th that we are going that we because we have used this function, okay, many many times. Uh, uh, but uh, until now, we haven't given a precise definition. We, uh, the definition which we have used is, is uh, uh, we, we plot. So uh, if we define the, this uh, symbol here in the, for those four cases, so for all rational numbers, uh, we can now plot a to the x, uh, where x uh, runs through all rational numbers. Uh, and what we get is uh, uh, some dotted graph. Uh, and from this dotted graph, we would observe that it looks, uh, so maybe I should do this once more. So from this from this dotted graph, we observe that uh, okay. So the most natural way to fill to fill the holes, uh, or in other words, to uh, define this symbol here uh, in the case where x is an irrational number, is to define it such that the graph you see here is is getting increasing. Okay. Of course, you have different choices here, but. Uh, uh, you, you will make life as easy as possible. So you, you, uh, what you essentially want to have is that this function a to the x is, uh, doesn't behave too badly. Okay, so you will just fill, fill the holes such that the uh, graph is increasing. And till now we use this definition, uh, which is not really a, a, a precise definition, not really satisfactory. Okay, so uh, from now on we assume we assume that a to the x was never defined. Okay. We assume that we that the logarithm. If you cannot define a to the x, then the logarithmic functions are also not defined. Okay. The only thing, but the only thing which is defined is a to the x, where x is a rational number. Okay. This is something we can define here. Okay. So we forget about this here. Okay. So, uh, uh, but I just remind you. Uh, 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 once we have defined this symbol. This is also what we have done in the first lecture. So first we uh, define this symbol a to the x here by this not very precise uh, definition. Okay. Then we argued that uh, there might uh, there is a number. Okay. So if you look if you look at uh, the graph of a to the x now, if a to the x is defined like this in this sloppy way, if you look at the graph of a to the x uh, and you choose for a for instance two uh, and you plot the graph, it seems like at zero. You have a tangent, okay, and the, te and the slope of the tangent uh, at zero seems to be uh, sm smaller than one, okay, 
And if you choose for A is equal to 3, it seems to be larger than 1. So we guessed that there might be a number. Uh, this number was a natural number, which satisfies that if you choose this number of space, uh, the slope of the tangent at 0 is equal to 1. Okay, so this was our next step. Uh, so in the first lecture, I defined first a to the x. Then I defined what is e to the x. Then I used this in order to define the logarithmic functions. Uh, and I, special, I, I, I also used a special case for the logarithmic functions where the base is equal to e, which is called the, the natural logarithm. Okay. So in the first lecture, this is actually this was the way we proceeded. Okay. So from the exponential function, from e to the a, from a to the x then to e to the x as a special case, uh, then to the logarithmic functions, and then to ln x as a special case. Okay, so this is important to notice because uh, now uh, where we want to give a precise definition, we have to get, go the other way around, actually. Okay so, uh, okay, so the most important thing for the SQL is you forget that, you, that we know already a to the x, uh, and we, know, we, uh, uh, we, we, we do not know any properties okay, of this function and so on. You should forget all this. Uh, okay, so uh, if you have defined this symbol till now, a to the x, only for, for the case where x is a rational number, uh, of course we can still define uh, uh, like differentiation of functions uh, because it's a general notation. We can also define integration. We can prove the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus and so on. So all the theory we have developed is available for general functions. Now, uh, if we if we would have never defined a to the x, okay, we, uh, uh, once we define the integral, okay, we would observe something interesting, namely, uh, uh, as I have said, okay, uh, uh, every continuous function has an antiderivative. Uh, so, and uh, normally, the only way to guess antiderivatives is uh, uh, the only way to find antiderivatives for us. Expressions for antiderivatives is by guessing. Now, for this case here, so f of x is equal to x to the alpha, okay, because uh, uh, if, we ha if, we have, uh, if we have looked at the case uh, where, assume that alpha is an uh, integer, okay, so in, in, in this case, this symbol here is defined, okay, no problem, and uh, we can discuss the properties of this function. In particular, we can easily prove that the derivative of this function is alpha x to the alpha minus 1. Okay, and now if we want to inverse the uh, question, okay, so here we go from this function, from the, from the power function to the derivative. Now if we uh, ask, okay, what is the antiderivative of this function? Okay, of course we are going to use this here. So we see that the antiderivative here, f of x, a uh, one antiderivative is given by x to the alpha plus 1 over alpha plus 1, but we observe that uh, there, is o there is one case we cannot cover, namely the case uh, minus 1. Okay. So if we would have never defined the exponential function, okay, we, uh, we, at this point we still have the question, okay, so what is the antiderivative of 1 over x? Okay. And we cannot, we, we, cannot, we cannot find an expression for it. Okay. Uh, uh, but we know because 1 over x on the interval from 0 to infinity is a continuous function, so it must have an antiderivative. Uh, we also know, we also can give a complicated uh, version of the antiderivative, uh, namely uh, the integral from 1 to x uh, dt over t is an antiderivative of the function 1 over t. Okay. And uh, as I have explained last time, if we cannot find the antiderivative, what we do is, okay, we give it their own name. So at this stage, we would say, okay, this function is called uh, L of x. Okay. So at this stage, we would define a new function, which is very natural, uh, namely the function, which is the antiderivative of this function here. If we define this, the function like this here, what can we derive about this function? Okay, so the definition... It can so you you the important thing is you you must forget that this is that this is the logarithm okay it's kind of uh, uh, so this kind of surprise here or the, uh, what is complicated here was already spoiled in high school okay so uh, uh, if we would have never defined exponential functions and logarithms okay we would here naturally we, we, we naturally uh, would define here at this stage we uh, would give this function here a new name l of t uh, l of x okay so uh, if we look at this fun function, we can immediately observe uh, some easy properties. So we see that, for instance, if x is larger than, than 1, 
Okay, then we see that this actually is just an area. Okay, so the area below uh, below the function bond over t and the path dx axis from one to x. So in this case, L of x must be larger than zero because it's an area. Uh, if x is equal to one, we see okay uh, L of one because it's the integral from one to one equal to zero. And uh, uh, if x is smaller than zero, we see that L of x uh, can be written as minus the integral from uh, x to 1 dt over t. And this here is, again, an area. OK, so we get here something smaller than 0. So uh, actually, already from this definition, we see that uh, uh, this new function here, the new function L of x, uh, uh, is uh, 0 here at this point is positive here and negative here. And it's just defined for x larger than 0, of course. So maybe I should stress this. Uh, uh, because otherwise, this function 1 over t is not continuous. Okay? So it can just be defined. This definition just works for x is larger than 0. So already from, from these simple properties, we can say something about the graph of this function. We slightly understand the behavior of the graph. Now. Uh, actually, we also know that this function here is very smooth. Okay, this function is uh, uh, is uh, continuous. Uh, the function is even differentiable. But this we know from the fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, and we know that the derivative of this function is equal to one over x, okay, which is always larger than zero. So we see that the function must be increasing. Okay, so we know now the function is here positive, the function is here negative, and is always increasing. Uh, also from this, we can compute the second derivative. Which is always smaller than zero, which means the, the function is conca concave downward. Okay, now we already know quite a lot. So we already know that the, from this, we already know that the function must look like okay, something like this here. But uh, we, we still do not know what happens if x tends to infinity. What happens if x tends to zero? Okay, we do not know it because we uh, we cannot find the uh, uh, expression for this function here. So the next step, uh, because the next uh, the, the only thing in all, in order to completely understand the graph of this function, which in, in some sense uh, uh, helps us to completely understand the function. Uh, so the only case, the only situation which is left is to order to figure in, is to understand what happens if x tends to zero. What happens if x tends to infinity? Now, before we can look at this case, we have to prove some properties. Uh, uh, now, the properties we, we, we want to prove, actually, we know them already. But we have to use this definition here to prove it. OK, so we want to prove that L of x times y is equal to L of x plus L of y. We want to prove that L of x over y is L of x minus L of y. And we want to prove that L of x to the r is equal to r L of x. And this holds here for all r. In, so this always x and y must be larger than 0. And this for all r uh, in q. Who can tell me why, why, why r in q? Why not r in, 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 in the real numbers? Right, because we haven't defined it for uh, for, the, for irrational numbers. This symbol is not defined. So, we, so uh, it, it wouldn't make sense to say for all r in, 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 in the re, for all real numbers. OK, so uh, we will see that from those properties, OK, those properties will help us to prove that uh, the function L of x, as x tends to infinity, tends to infinity. And if x tends to 0, tends to minus infinity. We will see this from this property. So we first prove this, those properties. Uh, now, how to prove this, those properties? So the first one. OK, so uh, let's look at this function here. L of x alpha, where alpha is a constant. OK, so let's look at this function. Uh, so what do we know about this function? If we compute the derivative. Okay, we can compute the derivative. If this is a constant here, we compute the derivative by the chain rule. Okay, so the, the derivative of the outer function is the L, but this derivative we know is 1 over x, evaluated at the inner function. OK, 
Okay, so 1 over, evaluated at the inner function, times the derivative of the inner function, which is alpha equal to 1 over x. Okay, so what do we observe? Uh, that uh, uh, this function, the derivative of this function, okay, and the derivative of our L is the same. Okay, so we know that those two functions uh, just differ by constant. Okay, so L of uh, alpha x is equal to L of x plus a constant. Now, how to compute the constant? We know already that uh, L of 1 uh, is uh, equal to 0. So if we plug in x is equal to 1, we see that c must be L of alpha. So we have, we have proved that L of alpha x is equal to L of x plus L of alpha. Okay, so this proves this property here. Now, the next thing is we want to prove this property. Okay, so first we look at, uh, so we know that 0 is L of 1, right? We know we can write 1 as, uh, as y times 1 over y. Okay, now we can apply what we have already proved. Uh, so by this here, we have this is L of y plus L of 1 over y. Okay, so this proves that L of 1 over y is minus L of y. Okay. Now from this we can deduce uh, the second property. Okay, so L of x over y, we can write this as L of x times 1 over y. Okay, but this here is because of the first property which we have already proved is L of x plus L of 1 over y. And because of this property, this is minus L of y. So what we get is L of x minus L of y. Okay, so this confirms this property here. Now what is left is the last one. Uh, observe that the last one, actually, for the case where r is a positive integer, no problem, we use the first one. For the case where r is a negative integer, also no problem, we use this one. Okay, so those two, or you can also use this one. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the only problem you have is uh, if you have a real fraction here for r. Okay, so if uh, uh, so, let's m maybe first look at the case where you have a fraction, this one. Okay, now uh, this means okay that uh, y over q is equal to x. Okay, now you apply l on both sides, so l of y over q is equal to l of x, but here. Because uh, this, this Q here is, uh, so we assume that Q is larger than zero. It's, it's a natural number. Now here you can use the first property. Okay, so this, this will be equal to uh, Q times L over X. Uh, sorry, L over Y is equal to L over X. So you see that uh, uh, L of Y is equal to 1 over Q L of X. But Y is equal to X to the 1 over Q. Okay, so we have proved this property now for the case where r is equal to 1 over q. Okay, so from this you see that L of x to the 1 over q is really 1 over q L of x. Okay, and if you now, if you now look at the general case, x to the p over q, you, again, you use, you use either this or this here, depending if p is positive, okay, you use the first property. If p is negative, you use the second property. And you see, indeed, it's p over q, L of x. So this confirms this here. Okay, so this proves our result. Okay, so any questions so far? So you need, you see what we actually need here? What we have used in order to prove this here is uh, uh, the mean value theorem because we have used that if the derivative of two functions uh, equals uh, on an uh, open interval, then the function just differ by constant. This is what we have used here, and all the other all the other properties we have deduced from those two from, from actually from this one. So you can from this property you, you can already fo follow two, you can already follow three. 
you see, if, if you have given such an equation, okay, uh, also this must be satisfied. So uh, you see from the, uh, you see quite a lot of properties from this. You also see if you plug in x and y is equal to one, okay, then you have here l of one is equal to two l of one. So l of one must be equal to zero and so on and so forth. It can be proved under 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 very weak conditions that the only solution of this uh, so-called functional equation is uh, the logarithm. Okay, but this is not something we want to discuss here. Now, uh, uh, what we still want to figure out, so our, our, our goal is to figure out, okay, what happens with L of x is if x tends to zero or x tends to uh, infinity. Now, this is helpful here. So now we can prove uh, that the limit as x tends to infinity of L of x infinity and the limit as x tends to zero from the right, of course, of L of x is equal to minus infinity. Uh, so, uh, sorry, this is a result, it's not a proof. Okay, so how to prove this? Now, this easily follows from those properties. You see, uh, we look at ln of, of L of, let's say, 2 to the n, okay, where n is a positive integer. Now, if we use this property, okay, or you can also use this property, uh, what you get is n L2, okay, but L2 is uh, larger than zero, okay, something we have observed already. So if n tends to infinity, this will tend to infinity, as n tends to infinity. Okay, so this just tell you that this just tells you that if you choose those special sequence for x. Okay, L of this special sequence will tend to infinity as n tends to infinity. But uh, the function L of x, we have already observed, is, is increasing. Okay, uh, so you have here uh, L of x is increasing. So, of course, if you look at the, spe uh, at the special sequence and you can figure out for a special sequence that L of x tends to infinity as n tends to infinity, this will hold for L of x as well. So you get that the limit of L of x as x tends to infinity is indeed infinity. Okay, now, uh, of course, this is trivial. This follows from this one. Because uh, uh, if you want to compute this limit here, okay, what you can do is you write this as the limit uh, y tends to infinity of L of 1 over y. But we have just seen that L of 1 over y is minus L of y. Okay, so you have this is the limit as y tends to infinity of minus L of y. But we have just proved that this uh, tends to infinity, so this must tend to minus infinity. Okay, so this already explains now. For this function L of x, which we have defined uh, via an integral, we know now already quite a lot, so we know that the function is uh, uh, larger than zero here, smaller than zero here. The function is increasing. The fun function is concave downward. Uh, the function as x tends to zero tends to, to minus infinity, and as x tends to uh, infinity tends to plus infinity. So indeed, this, you have this graph here. Okay. So we have just deduced this property from the uh, from the definition uh, of the function uh, L of x. Okay, uh, uh, actually we even know more, we know that this function L of x is differentiable and so on, so we know more properties about this uh, uh, function. The differentiable essentially follows from the, uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, uh, okay, so uh, now L of x is well defined, and uh, what is more important, we understand the function L of x, uh, so we know roughly how the, we know quite well, we understand quite well how the function behaves. Now, uh, the next important observation is, okay, since you know that this function tends to infinity as x tends to infinity, and the function is continuous, uh, okay, so uh, uh, from those properties, and the in you, can, you can use the intermediate value theorem to deduce uh, that there must be uh, s some x uh, where L of x is equal to 1. Okay, so from the intermediate value theorem,
Because, because L of x is continuous, L of uh, 1 is equal to 0, and if you choose x large enough, L of x will be very large. It will certainly be larger than 1. Okay? So you choose 1, which is between 0 and the large value, and you, will, you get there is an x, uh, which we call E. So there is an E such that L of E is equal to 1. Okay? And this E is called natural number. You, you should compare this definition of E with the definition I've given in the first lecture, okay? In the first, it, the definition which I've given in the first lecture, okay, has two problems, uh, namely, so in the first lecture I've looked at A to the X. I haven't defined A to the X precisely. This, of course, is the first problem. But apart from this, uh, I have argued that if I look at 2 to the X and 3 to the X uh, and I check out the slope of the tangent at 0, okay, it seems to, it seems to be that for 2 to the X, the slope is smaller than 1. For 3 to the X, it's larger than 1. So I, I said, okay, there, there should be a number between 2 and 3 uh, such that uh, if I choose this number as space, uh, the slope of the tangent at 0 is equal to 1. Of course, this definition has many problems. The first question is, okay, does the slope exist? Okay, it's the first question. The second question is, uh, uh, does such a number exist? Okay, so uh, this proof was not very precise, okay? But uh, this proof, uh, 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 this definition, sorry, n not this proof, this definition was not very precise. But this definition here of E is, is precise, okay? Because we, ha we have proved already the intermediate value theorem, okay? And we know that the function L of x is continuous, and we just apply the theorem in order to get this number E here. So this is something which is precise. So this is the huge dif difference there. Okay, now uh, our next step would be, uh, since we observe that this function is increasing, this means that this function is 1 to 1, so, we, so there is an inverse function. Okay, so L of x is increasing. From this we know that L of x is 1 to 1. Okay, so there exists the inverse function. And the inverse function, we, uh, we, we give it a name, so we call it e to the e of x. Okay, so this, this, this is the inverse function of L. Okay, so uh, we define so we define e of x is equal to y if l of y is equal to x. Now, uh, if we just look at the graph, because we understand already the graph of l, okay, so we know that uh, uh, the graph of L looks like this here. Okay, so this is L of x. Uh, so we know that uh, the graph of the inverse function, okay, is obtained by reflecting about the line y is equal to x. So uh, if you look at this line here, then uh, the graph of the inverse function, okay, it's like, it looks like this here. Okay, so, and, and, and actually, we can obtain many properties of the function e of x from the function l of x. Uh, actually, we haven't proved that many property in this lecture, but uh, uh, I told you that you can prove here a couple of properties. You can prove that uh, if a function is increasing, the inverse function will be increasing as well. If a function is continuous, the inverse function will be continuous as well. If a function uh, is differentiable, the inverse function will be uh, only uh, there's no, so if, if a function is differentiable, but uh, what you have to avoid is that you have a, a point where the derivative is equal to zero, then the inverse function is uh, differentiable as well, and so on and so forth. So uh, actually, many properties of the original function are, are inherited by the inverse function. Okay, and from those, from such results, okay, you uh, uh, 
get now already a couple of results about e to the x. So you know that e to the x is also a differentiable function which is increasing, which is concave upward, uh, uh, and uh, which satisfies that if x tends to minus infinity, this function will go to zero, and if x tends to plus infinity, this function will go to infinity. All this you get already from the uh, from r results concerning a function and its inverse function. And this already helps you quite well to understand the graph here. Also, you have uh, uh, what we called in the first lecture can cancellation equations. Uh, so you have that uh, L of E of X is equal to X uh, for all X in R. And you have E of L of X is equal to X for all x larger than zero, the cancellation equations, uh, and uh, uh, we, also, we also get that domain and range uh, uh, change their role, so uh, the domain of E of x is equal to R, and the range of E of x is equal to zero from infinity to this half open in interval. Uh, also, uh, as I have explained, uh, we already know from uh, general results about functions and inverse functions that uh, E of x must be differentiable. And we also know how to compute the, the derivative. Uh, we just use the method of implicit differentiation. Uh, so if we want to compute the derivative of this function, okay, just to rewrite this uh, as L of Y is equal to X, uh, then we take the derivative here by the method of implicit differentiation we know is 1 over Y times the derivative of Y is equal to 1. So the derivative of this function is equal to itself. Uh, so from this, uh, if we write it, for instance, in Leibniz notation, then this means that uh, if you take the derivative of this function, uh, it will remain the same. Also this you can easily prove. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, you can also easily prove some easy. Some, uh, you can co collect the well-known properties of e to the x. Uh, you easily prove that e to the x plus y is equal to e of x times e of y. You prove that uh, e to the x minus y is equal to e of x over e of y, and you prove that e of x to the r is equal to e r x. And of course, here you have to assume that r is irrational, because otherwise uh, 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 this symbol here might not be defined. And the way you prove this is uh, you just apply L on both sides, use the, cancel, cancel, the, the uh, cancellation equations. Uh, and uh, here, for instance, here, if you're if you apply L on both sides, you get here on the left-hand side x plus y. You get on the right-hand side, you use what we have already proved, namely L of the product is the sum of the uh, Ls. Uh, and in both cases, you get x and y. So uh, if you apply L on both sides, okay, you get an identity. And since the function L is uh, injective, okay, you can uh, remove the L. And this proves, for instance, this one. And this and this property are just proved in the same way. At this stage, we are now almost ready to uh, define uh, at least e to the x, okay? Because uh, we observe that uh, uh, if you look at if you look at this one, okay? So you observe that you can write this uh, by definition of uh, uh, the number e, okay? One is equal to l of e. And now you use the cancellation equation, so th you see this is equal to uh, e. Or more general. Uh, if you replace this here by uh, an r here, then you can, uh, where r is a rational number, okay, so you observe that uh, uh, you can multiply here l of e because this is equal to 1. Now, if r is a rational number, okay, we have already proved that uh, uh, r times l of some number is l of the number to the r. Okay, and here you use the cancellation equations, so you get this is equal to e to the r. Okay, and this now motivates to define e to the x, because uh, you see that uh, this symbol was up to now was just defined for rational numbers. Okay, but this symbol here is defined for uh, for all real numbers r. Okay, so at this stage it makes now sense to say e to the x. Okay, this function here. 
Okay. So, uh, or in other words, because you see that uh, if x is a rational number, okay, then this identity is, uh, uh, is is satisfied because we have defined already this symbol and this symbol, okay. So you extend the uh, definition of this symbol here, okay, uh, in such a way that this property still holds. You observe, you, you observe in the same way that uh, if you look at a to the r, where r is a, a rational number, okay, so you can write this, because of the cancellation equation, you can write this as e of l of a to the r, okay, and here uh, we have already proved that uh, you can write this as r times l of a, okay, but now you see that uh, using, using our new uh, function e, okay, we can write this as e to the r l of a, but this now here suddenly makes sense for all r, okay, for all real numbers. So you extend this definition uh, of this symbol in such a way that this relation here still holds, so you define a to the x to be equal to uh, e to the x l of a. And you can use uh, uh, what you already know about this function, or about this function, uh, in order to uh, uh, discuss this function here. Okay, so you can prove now that, uh, for instance, if, because we know that L of A, if A is larger than 1, we know that L of A is larger than 0. So in this case, this function must be increasing. If uh, A is smaller than 1, then this is smaller than 0, so the function must be decreasing and so on and so forth. Now, the rest is simple, okay? We also see that if A is, lar if a is not equal to 1, this new function here is 1 to 1, so we can look at the inverse, uh, and the inverse function will be called the general logarithmic function. So this gives you a precise definition, okay, of uh, the exponential functions and the logarithmic functions. So you should be, uh, this is the section 5.6 in our textbook, and uh, this is just to, m to make it clear uh, uh, what this uh, section is about. Uh, so, uh, because I, I have already explained, okay, that actually some, some textbooks in calculus, uh, quite a lot of them, this is maybe an exception, they normally postpone the definition of the exponential function and the logarithmic function, okay, to a chapter which is, uh, which, which is behind integration, okay. So bef before they talk about integration, they will never, never talk about exponential functions or logarithmic functions, uh, and also all the examples will not involve those functions, okay. The, the, the reason why this textbook is different because it cuts down the number of possible examples, okay. If you do not define those functions from the beginning, okay, you do not have that many examples. Okay, so it's more convenient to allow this function uh, from the beginning. And, actu and actually, it's quite easy to grasp what the meaning of those functions is, uh, uh, because you have, uh, in, in high school, you have developed uh, uh, some intuitive feeling about those functions. Uh, so in, in some way, you understand those functions from uh, high school, or at least you think that you understand them. And, uh, uh, but in order to define them pri precisely, you, you certainly need some deeper tools in mathematics, either integration or, what we are or, or tools we are going to learn next semester, or limits. At least you need limits in order to uh, define precisely the function a to the x and uh, uh, ln of x. If you, if you look at, our, uh, uh, at the corresponding section in our textbook, you will see that uh, uh, the author does not stop here, but co goes on to... Uh, 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 discuss properties of this function and then the properties of the logarithmic function, but this is actually identical with uh, what we have done in the first lecture and also what you find already previously in our textbook. Uh, because now uh, we have defined this function a to the x and in the first lecture we started from this function. Also, uh, this is the last thing I want to emphasize. Uh, also from this point of view, it's quite natural why the Natural logarithm, uh, natural logarithm is called natural logarithm, okay? Because uh, uh, as we have seen, uh, uh, once you enter integration, okay, the domain of integration or the domain of antiderivatives, okay, uh, you quite naturally discover, okay, that uh, it's easy to find the antiderivative of x to the alpha, where alpha is uh, uh, is uh, integer, except in one case, namely alpha is equal to minus one. Okay, so it's at, at this stage, it's very natural to give this function, to give the antiderivative of this function a new name. Uh, now, uh, as I have explained, before we go on to uh, 
learning more about integration, in particular techniques of integration. Uh, we discussed some applications uh, uh, of integration, namely computing, computing gen more general areas uh, computing and computing volumes. This is uh, uh, chapter six of our textbook. Uh, uh, so, so the first subsection is about computing areas between functions. That, this is certainly something you have done in high school as well. Uh, so assume we have given two functions, f of x uh, and g of x, and assume that f of x is larger or equal than g of x. Uh, now, uh, if we, let's plot the picture. Okay, so let's say this is the function g of x and this is the function f of x. Now, uh, what we have done already, we have already defined the area below f of x and above the x-axis. Okay, so we have already defined this area here. Uh, but you see that here you have an area as well, and this one. Okay, so the question is, uh, or the natural question, or the natural thing to do is to extend our definition of the area to uh, uh, such a situation. Okay, so uh, uh, you should be, uh, once more, okay, uh, you see here that there is an area, okay, but this area is not defined, so we have to define it. It's a, it so what we have to do is to define it, not to compute it. Okay. Uh, now, uh, in order to define such an area, okay, we will just use the same approach as we have used for uh, the area of, of a positive function f of x, uh, uh, which lies below the function and above the x-axis. Uh, namely, what we are going to do is we divide the interval from a, if this is a and this is b here. So let's, just, let's say we divide the interval from a to b into subintervals. We choose in every subinterval the sample point, okay, and uh, approximate then the area by the area of a rectangle, uh, where we use uh, as a height of the rectangle. Uh, F evaluated at the sample point, uh, so, so it, it, we just look at this height here. Then we look, we use this height as the height of the rectangle in order to approximate the area on this smaller subinterval. We sum over the, all the areas uh, of the sub rectangles, and then we make the subdivision smaller and smaller. And in the limit, we will get if we have a value, we will uh, name we, uh, this value will be the area uh, of uh, uh, the domain you see here. Okay, so if we uh, if we do this formally, okay, so we again we divide a b into subintervals. Uh, so let's say x n, which is uh, uh, a plus uh, delta x times uh, times n, and delta x is equal to or let's say this is x i. Let's say delta x is equal to b minus a over n. We will choose sample points. So x i star is a sample point in the i sub interval interval okay and then we will look at the riemann sums uh, so we will uh, look at the sums uh, i from 1 to n now uh, maybe i should i should show you the picture here Okay, so we divide this interval here into subintervals. Okay, so if this, for instance, is the i subinterval, what we are going to do is uh, we choose a sample point. So let's say the sample point is this one. And now the height. Uh, of the rectangle which we are going to use in order to approximate the area of this piece here uh, will be 
this function minus this function here uh, times uh, so if we if we compute the area times the length of the subinterval so we have uh, uh, f of x i star minus g uh, of x i star times delta of x uh, okay so, so uh, what you see here okay is uh, will be the area of this rectangle here this will approximate the corresponding area uh, we will sum over all the area of those rectangles and let uh, and 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 then consider the limit as n tends to infinity and uh, if this limit exists okay we will define this area here which you see uh, by this limit here if this lim i should say if this limit exists and is independent uh, of the choice of the sample sequence as you have seen this is not necessarily the case for all functions okay in, in the uh, assignments so in the assignments you saw an example for a function where uh, uh, th this limit okay is, uh, exists for some special choices of the uh, sample sequence but might be different uh, depending on the choice of the sample sequence uh, so in this case the area does not is it's not you cannot define the area so the area is undefined uh, but uh, uh, if this limit here exists and is independent of the choice of the sample sequence, okay, we will say the, we will define the area here which you see uh, by the values of those limits. Okay, so we will define define the area of the uh, of this domain here. By this limit. Now, this uh, actually. Uh, just extends the definition uh, of uh, uh, of an area okay to a more general situation okay so now we, we also can include uh, uh, domains which are uh, uh, which are bounded above and below by some functions and you see already from this definition okay it's, it's quite clear that if both functions f and g are continuous okay then uh, since you know that if g of x is equal to zero this limit here will exist whenever f is continuous uh, so it's easy to guess that if f and g are both continuous uh, then uh, uh, this limit here will exist and will be independent of the choice of the sample sequence so in this case you have an area okay so this extends in some way the definition of our area uh, of our area and we will further extend it today now uh, this is this is quite awkward okay this, uh, you start with the area below a function above the x-axis now you extend the area notation to this situation and so on so uh, actually there is a own a own sub area of mathematics okay which is which is dedicated to the problem of defining areas uh, but uh, this is much deeper and you might learn this in more advanced classes on mathematics uh, so here we will just we will uh, of course we uh, we also want to include other areas in our definition okay which are not necessarily bounded from above and below by a continuous function uh, and we will give a suitable uh, definition for uh, more general uh, uh, areas of more general domains you also observe here using this, def this definition because you observe that this is here a Riemann sum so you observe that you can use the integral in order to compute this area namely the area is given by the integral from a to b f of x minus g of x d of x you also observe that uh, in the special cases where g of x is equal to zero okay what you get is our previous area this is something of course if you extend if you have a definition already for a, a class of objects and you want to make the class of objects larger okay the new definition should be the same on the previous uh, for the previous objects okay so this is the case here so you see that if g of x is equal to zero uh, then uh, the area which we have now defined for this situation is equal to uh, the previous definition you also see that uh, uh, this definition certainly makes sense of the area namely uh, if you look at the situation where f of x is larger or equal than g of x is larger or equal than zero okay so uh, So in this case, uh, you see that you have uh, you have one area, namely. Uh, so if this is f of x uh, and this is g of x, okay, uh, 
Okay, so you have an area A1, which is uh, the area <coughs> below uh, f of x and above the x-axis. And you have an area A2, which is uh, the area below g of x and above the x-axis. OK, so actually, those two areas are already, we have already defined them previously. Now, uh, in this situation, it's, uh, if I ask you, OK, how to define this area here? OK, so the more natural way to define it uh, would be, OK, you say it's A mi A1 minus A2, OK, because the area should have this property. OK, so actually, uh, the more natural definition would be in this situation uh, to define the area, so the, the area of the red domain here, okay, uh, just by subtracting A1 and A2. And uh, you have to observe we have defined this area here already, namely this area was defined as the integral from A to B f of x dx, and this area was uh, defined as the integral from a to b, uh, g of x, dx. Uh, and we, uh, today we have defined this area, namely this area. Uh, we have seen that the definition which, that from the definition it comes out that this area must be defined like, should be defined like this here. And you see this makes perfect sense, okay? So the definition of today uh, would be the same, okay? As saying in this situation, okay, you define A by using this relation here. Okay, so everything makes sense. Okay, this is something we, this is a property you certainly want to have uh, of the area. Okay, so uh, we have now extended the definition uh, of the area in order to cover domains which are bounded from above and below by continuous functions. And the definition which we have given uh, not only covers uh, the previous definition, but also makes, makes sense in this sense here. Okay. close by uh, y is equal to x to the cube minus x, y is equal to 3x, which is in the first and fourth quadrant. OK, so uh, those are typical examples where you have to compute uh, the area of a domain, as I have just uh, uh, shown you. Uh, so uh, maybe just to remind you, because uh, the first thing, maybe some of you do not know what this is supposed to mean, the first and fourth qu quadrant. Uh, uh, so we, we call this here the first quadrant, second, third, and fourth. Uh, OK, so uh, uh, a, quad a quadrant is, is, is normally such a piece here, okay, such a part of the plane. Uh, and the uh, order which we use is uh, counterclockwise. So this is the first, second, third, and fourth. Uh, okay, this is terminology. Uh, now, uh, uh, so we have here two curves, okay, and we should find the area which is enclosed by those two curves and lies in the first and fourth uh, gradient. Normally, if you uh, do such an example, of course, the first thing you have, uh, you, you have to figure out is uh, uh, how does this uh, domain look like, okay? And for this, normally, if the functions are complicated, uh, normally you have to do, you have to discuss some simple properties of those functions. Uh, uh, the first thing you certainly have to do is you have to find the point of intersection. Okay, so you, you look at this equation here. So you see that uh, uh, x to the cube uh, uh, minus 4x is equal to 0. Now we are just interested, because of this assumption here, we are just interested in non-negative x. Uh, so you see x is equal to 0 is one point of intersection, and x is equal to 2. Of course, you have also x is equal to minus 2, but we are not interested in this point. Uh, so uh, this function is easy. This function is a line. 
Okay, but maybe in order to understand this function, you have to discuss more properties. Uh, uh, so, for, you, for instance, uh, uh, if you take the first derivative, you see that the function is always increasing. Okay. Uh, if you equate it to zero, you see that uh, the function is, uh, uh, if x is larger or equal than zero, is zero for zero and uh, one. Okay, so from those properties, you already know that. Uh, okay, so the other function will look like look like this here, where uh, this point here is equal to 2. Okay. Uh, so uh, normally, if you have to solve such, a, such an example, uh, if the functions are more complicated, okay, you have to do, you have to discuss certain properties in order to understand, okay, how does this area look like? Uh, but the computation is now easy because you observe that uh, uh, this area is bounded above by a line and below by this function here. So by the definition, just plugging into the definition, we see that uh, the area is equal to the integral from 0 to 2, uh, the upper function, 3x, uh, minus the lower function, so x to the cube minus x dx. Uh, and this is now easy to compute. So what you get is 3x uh, uh, squared half uh, evaluated at 0 and 2. So actually, uh, minus plus 4, 4. So here, 4 uh, minus, uh, and then you have x to the 4 over 4 evaluated at 0 and 2. So you get this is 4, 2, this is 8, minus 16, 4, 4. So what you get is 4. Okay. So you, uh, you see, uh, whenever you have to solve such an, example, uh, uh, such an example, the first thing you normally have to do is you have to understand how does the uh, area look like here. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, in some cases, uh, this might involve that you have to, uh, to uh, discuss certain properties of this curve here. But for instance, for this curve, it's easy because you see that uh, the x-intercept is equal to 1 and the function is always increasing. This will already show you that the function looks like this here and will already determine uh, the area. So uh, whenever solving such an example, the first thing is to plot a picture and then to just plug into the definition close by uh, y is equal to x square y is equal to x to the cube I oh, know 8 minus x square y is equal to x square x from x is equal to minus 3 x is equal to 3 Okay, so this is another easy situation. Uh, now, also in this case, so the first thing you have to do is you should plot a picture. Okay, so it's easy to understand how those functions look like. Uh, x squared is like this here. Okay, then the second function is this one. So this looks similar, but at x is equal to 0, you are at 8. So uh, you also observe that uh, uh, those two functions meet at the points x is equal to minus 2 and uh, 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 2. So you have here minus 2. You have here 2. So you get something which roughly, there's not a lot, not a lot of space, but okay. Looks like this here. Now, uh, but we have to, to we have to, to look at the area from uh, from uh, uh, minus 3 to 3. So you see that uh, uh, what you have here is, uh, okay, so this would be this area here. And then you have this part here. And you have this part here. Okay. Uh, and the first thing which you observe is actually if... Uh, strictly speaking, the first thing is this area, we haven't defined it yet, okay? Because uh, we, have defined, we have defined the area of uh, uh, domains which are uh, either uh, bounded above and below by continuous functions uh, or uh, of domains which are below a given function and above the x-axis. But this, uh, this domain which you see here, okay, is, 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 not of, is not of those two types, okay? So strictly speaking, we have, again, if we encounter something like this, we have to uh, 
we have to extend our definition of the area. And in this case, it's, it's of course quite natural how to do it. Namely, we just compute the area of this piece, this piece, and this piece. Everything is defined already, and then we add those three pieces. Okay, so more general, uh, uh, if you have two functions, f of x and g of x, we will define the area between those two functions uh, uh, in the same way. Okay, so we will look at uh, on which intervals is f of x larger than g of x, on which intervals is g of x larger than equal than f of x, and compute on the area on the corresponding intervals and sum up the areas. So in general, uh, if f of x, so assume that f of x and g of x are continuous functions, then the area uh, between f of x and g of x on AP is defined as Okay, so this area, by definition, we look at the integral from A to B, and then the absolute value of f of x minus g of x dx. This is the same as to say that, because of properties of the integral, this is the same as to say that, uh, as to say as we, we first try to, we first figure out on which sub-intervals is f of x larger or equal than g of x, on which sub-intervals is f of x smaller or equal than g of x, uh, and then compute the corresponding areas and add them up. You see, you see already from here, you should already, you should realize from this, okay, that uh, uh, trying to define the area, okay, for as many domains as possible, okay, it's not, it's not an easy problem, okay. We, 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 we started, we started from a domain which was below, below a given function above the x-axis. We extended it to a domain which is from above and below, uh, uh, bounded by a continuous function. Now we have a more general case, okay? But still, we do we can like this. We cannot cover all 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 areas of all domains, okay? So uh, as I have explained, there is your own a own subject in mathematics, a own branch of mathematics which is just dedicated to the question, okay? For how many domains can you define in a logical sense the area? This is not the easy problem. The so-called area problem, general area problem, is not the easy problem. Now, but uh, uh, if you look at easy areas, okay, we were always able, able to use the, our integral, the definite integral, in order to compute such areas. So also for this situation here, uh, we can, uh, just by evaluating this integral, we can compute this area here. So maybe that's the last thing I'm going to do. So if you see, if you, if we apply the definition which I just have given you, to this situation, uh, you see that actually for the area you just have to, uh, to compute the part, part with x is larger or equal than zero. You do not have to look at the uh, x is smaller than zero because everything is symmetric. So you just compute it. You, you, you just compute this area here and take it twice. Uh, uh, now uh, uh, this point here is two. So uh, the, 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 the area here, so only this part here is equal to uh, the integral. So you could write it as the integral from zero to three and then uh, the absolute value between those two functions. Uh, the f of x is equal to this one, and g of x is equal to this one. But uh, as we have seen, this, this is the same as to uh, look at the integral from 0 to 2. Here, the upper function is uh, the orange one, so 8 minus x squared. And the lower function is x squared. Plus, uh, and uh, for the remaining for the remaining uh, range of, of x, uh, uh, upper and lower function change their role. So here you have uh, x squared minus, and then you have eight 
minus x square dx. OK, and you solve this, and you have the area. And uh, you, you must multiply it by 2. OK, so also for this, in, in those general situations, uh, 